Okay, so there we go. I did it. Just for the record, everybody, it took me a long time to figure out how to do sharing. Too. Give me one second here. <laughs> Larry, how are we doing in the, in the registers coming on board? Excuse me? Um, people coming on, on, online? Uh, people are online. They're all waiting for you. And they can ask questions through the Q&A button. Uh, panelists can chat with each other through the chat button. And we are recording. And welcome, Gary. Thank you. To start. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Association for the Study of Cuban Economies 31st Annual Meeting. I think that makes us the longest existing Cuban organization in the US. At least that's what people tell me. Our conference today is on COVID and the Eighth Party Congress reforming the Cuban economy. It's actually gonna be much more than that. I have to tell you that we have been working uh, with great detail trying to um, uh, I'm sorry um, trying to get ready. We of course originally planned a um, in-person meeting that um, fell apart originally because the cost just escalated. Um, we changed locations and the cost just escalated well beyond our budget. And especially since with COVID, we didn't know how many people were going to attend. As it turns out, going virtual was a wise decision given the, the Delta variant that's now spreading everywhere, and particularly in Florida, thanks to a um, very intelligent governor we have. Um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't make political comments like that. Anyway, um, let me just, um, a few things. Um, on our web page, our first web page, um, you'll find um, a couple of emails where you can get technical help if you need it. Um, Joy, our, our recently hired, um, um, technical assistant will be standing by to answer your questions. I want to thank her personally right now. People don't know. Joy is located in Vietnam. So as she backs up this conference, she's going to be working through the wee hours of the morning. To have a Cuban in Vietnam indicates just how widespread now um, ASCII has become. Okay. I want to move ahead and um, just discuss the program for a minute. I mean, my slideshow is going to work, which it doesn't seem to be. There we go. So our morning session will be um, an economic and political context. Uh, you can see we have three great speakers. You'll get more bio information for them in a minute. Um, this afternoon, um, Terea Ordenamiento in its aftermath with Joaquin Peugeot as chair. Joaquin has been a member of ASCII, I think, almost since the beginning, and for many, many years did our, uh, publish our. Um, uh, a bulletin that included press reports. Um, and we have, you know, quite a few very good people for that session as well. Louise Louise has been with ASCII forever. So is Ernesto Hernandez Cata. Um, but we have Gabriel De Bella and Rafael Romeo, both formerly of the IMF, or I guess Gabriel still is, covers Eastern Europe. So um, very important. Tonight, we have an open mic session. Now, this is new. Um, there's two reasons we have, we have done an open mic session. One is that um, 
one of the great joys of our live conferences is the discussions that take place outside of the panels, between panels, over snacks, over coffee breaks, over lunch and over dinner. And it really adds an enormous amount to the learning process. Uh, we don't have that this year because we're doing virtual. So as a partial substitute, we're doing two open mic sessions. I'll discuss the other one in a few minutes. And that will give everybody a chance, or almost everybody, depending on how many people are, are um, participating, uh, a chance to say a few words. The other reason for the open mic sessions is as you are all aware, um, things are changing literally daily in Cuba. And our, our panel participants start writing their papers, you know, months earlier. Most of them have had to revise them several times. And, um, you know, if they had time, they probably could have revised them in the last two days as well. So this is going to be a chance also to catch up with any news that hasn't been covered in the panels. So please stop in for that panel. And tomorrow we um, have the international dimensions. This is a panel I might normally have participated in if I had any time to write this year. Um, and um, I think it's some good people, some good topics. Particularly interested in one on explaining Canadian foreign policy. Um, years ago, somebody wrote a paper called Northern Nice, which talked about Canada's failure under, was it, I don't know, Trudeau or who, to um, the failure of uh, Cuba's attempt to, to engage Cuba in intelligent discussion. So I'll be interested to see where they're going now. Uh, and then tomorrow afternoon, I'll have uh, some announcements at two o'clock. Um, hopefully, we'll have a lot to say except to thank everybody. I'm not going to thank everybody now, um, partially because it takes too much time and partially because they haven't had time to prepare the PowerPoints. But we've really had some great people, and I really appreciate what they've done. Uh, then at, at, at uh, 2.15, uh, the Cuban political economy challenges. Very, very, very important topic. Some of us, Larry in particular, but myself as well, have been writing for several years on the Cuba's political culture. Um, why, for the most part, why it can't change. Maybe it is changing now. Um, but I'm going to be looking, uh, we're going to be looking at that very carefully. I think everybody should pay attention to that. Okay, then uh, tomorrow night, we, I, I come back to haunt you uh, with another open mic session, the Cuba crisis and American policy responses. Now, this could be a very, very, very um, contentious discussion. As you know, Asking never takes positions on policy issues. Our, we are a research organization, we diffuse information, we, we give opinions, but as an organization, we do not take political positions. Um, nevertheless, with everything going on, I thought this was an important, an important session to hold. Um, if they registered, and I haven't seen registered, and I have two speakers, so I'll spend five minutes talking about their views, um, in any event, I will sort of lay out the beginning of the discussion and, 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 then, and then we're going to open it up. Now, ASCII has a very strong role from the beginning. Cuban issues are always contentious, always get very emotional. But in ASCII, we are all committed to civil discourse. Um, we discuss ideas, we do not attack persons, and we do so respectfully. Um, our panel chairs have been told that, and you know, I uh, expect them if somebody starts ranting, attacking others, to cut people off. I will definitely cut people off if they do that. This is a type of good discussion, but uh, but not acrimony. Okay, and then Saturday we have a session on agriculture. We do this every year. 
there should be a very good discussion as well. And this too, by the way, has an importance for, I'd like everybody to pass, attend who can. Um, we are gonna remember Pepin Alvarez. Pepin Alvarez was one of the founders, well, I guess he wasn't a founder, but he was in, um, uh, an early member of ASCII, um, was writing in Cuban agriculture long before anybody else thought about it. Uh, when he passed away this year, I went up and looked up some of his articles. A lot of them were published at, at the University of Florida. When I first went to Cuba, I knew nothing about Cuban agriculture and I spent an enormous amount of time just trying to understand the structure of it. I wish I had seen Pepin's Pe 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 um, articles at that time. So some close friends of his, including Jorge Perez Lopez, who of course does our program every year, Bill Messina, the person I don't know, are gonna be talking about Pepin. And then our last session, um, uh, we're gonna have, a, be chaired by Jorge Duani of the Cuban Studies Institute at the Florida International University. Um, ASCII has been working hard, uh, as has Duani, to integrate our programs. Um, had we had an annual, had we had a virtual uh, in-person meeting this year, we would have done it under their auspices at the Florida International University. Uh, that didn't work out, but they have a panel here on the recent work on a Cuban exodus. I do not know the speakers, a lot of them from the Institute, so I'm going to hopefully learn a lot. Uh, I should mention next year, we do plan to have a meeting, uh, in a, uh, a live meeting, also at Florida International University, but with the School of Law. Uh, I'll discuss that at, the, at a later time. So that's it. And um, I'm going to give everybody a two minutes to take a break, stretch, drink a cup of coffee, and then I will start our session. All right, if you can hear me, I need to share the screen. For some reason, it's not happening. All right, well, you want to try again? Yeah, to, try to right now. Well, there we go. I just want to show everybody's biography. Oh. Your your screen is not yet shared. There, there it is.
Okay. Okay, I guess we shall begin. So our first our first speaker is going to be Omar. I will bring up your um, slide presentation in a second, Omar. Um, but uh, you you may start. I just got to find your slide presentation. But it's here somewhere. Yo te voy diciendo, Gary, la otra, la otra, a la hora de cambiar, ¿no? O no sé. No, I've got it. I'm finding it. Just give me a second. Um, I'm not sure what's going on here. Hold on. Hold on. I'll, I'll be there in a second. Perfect. There we go. You got it? Sí, listo. Uh, Gary, could you share full screen? Because in that, uh, in that way, we cannot see the whole screen. I thought I had full screen. Uh, Try to go to display settings and change it in the top. Well, I've got to get at it. Let's see. I've got to figure out how to do that. I'll display settings. I see it. Sorry. Swap presenter view in slideshow. Yes, perfect. It? Thank you. You could go to the beginning now. Perfect, thank you. Okay. Comienzo. Sí. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias a Aski una vez más por tener la posibilidad, esta vez desde Cuba, eh, exponer mi, mis criterios. Eh, yo realmente eh, estamos en un momento bastante complicado eh, y por lo tanto eh, yo trato de, de presentar qué ha pasado después del primero de enero hacia acá. Es decir, ¿por qué el primero de enero? Porque es el día que comenzó la tarea de ordenamiento. Es decir, cada vez que hablamos, estamos hablando de lo que ha pasado realmente en este año 2021, que ha sido un año eh, bastante complejo. Eh, así podemos decir que en Cuba comienza esta tarea en el peor momento de, de económico. ¿Por qué decimos esto? Porque la otra. En Cuba, el año 2020... Es, eh, Realmente tuvo un desplome del Producto Interno Bruto de alrededor de un 11%. Eh, realmente hubo una caída muy pronunciada que ya venía cayendo desde el año 2019 y sin embargo eh, es verdad que la, los resultados no se observan en el corto plazo, pero ya en el primer semestre de 2021 volvió a caer la caída en un 2% y todo indica que en el segundo semestre no va a haber recuperación de la economía. Por lo tanto... Eh, esta tarea comenzó realmente en un momento muy complicado, siempre ha habido momentos complicados, pero nunca se había llegado hasta este momento. Eh, ha habido una ralentización económica y mucho eh, endurecimiento de las condiciones financieras. Gary, tienes que cambiar. Eh, y eso se, se realmente se acompañó de, de un deterioro de todos los indicadores macro, podemos decir, el déficit fiscal, la caída de las exportaciones, Toda una serie de, de, de indicadores que, que, que indicaban que realmente la economía estaba en, en, en un mal momento. Es decir, en el peor contexto imaginable es que se decidió eh, comenzar con este proceso de, de ordenamiento. Yo soy de los defensores que había que hacer esta tarea de ordenamiento. Yo creo que ha sido un paso imprescindible para destra destrabar otras transformaciones, aunque soy parte del de criterio de muchos expertos que yo me incluyo, que realmente tenía que haber antecedido otras reformas estructurales primero antes de llegar realmente a esta tarea de ordenamiento monetario. Y han tenido la razón, porque realmente eh, 
en un momento en que hay una de, está muy deprimida la oferta para esa demanda que se creó y se creó porque los salarios aumentaron eh, cinco veces, pero realmente la oferta no se incrementó o no se ha incrementado en esa misma por ciento. Y ahí tienen, tienen el gráfico eh, realmente que, que se acaba de, de, de poner, que es que el valor de la circulación mercantil minorista, vemos que estaba al, en el 2020 al mismo nivel del año 2011. Es decir, ni se pudo haber hecho en el 2016, en un momento de auge, estaba la, el, el periodo de Obama, eh, habían toda una serie de condiciones que se podía haber hecho en el 2016. Sin embargo, se hizo en el 2020, había que hacerlo. Ahora no se trata de si había que hacerlo, pero yo creo que detrás de todo eso lo que ha faltado eh, ha sido un problema de secuencia. Ahora, ¿en qué consistió esa tarea de ordenamiento? Porque no lo conoce. Primero, eh, se comenzó eliminando el CUC de la circulación. Se pasó al CUP, o sea, peso cubano, en todas las transacciones. Se dio una devaluación, a mi modo de ver, muy grande a hacer realmente la tasa que vino funcionando a más de 50 años de uno por uno en la empresa estatal, se eh, unificó a la tasa que tenía el sector privado de 1 a 24, y eso realmente fue un riesgo muy grande. Eh, se hizo también junto, eh, como parte de esa tarea, una reforma general de salario y de pensiones, en base a una llamada canasta, que todavía mucha gente dice, bueno, ¿en qué consiste la canasta? Pero realmente es una canasta seguro basada en una tasa de cambio de 1 a 24, sin embargo, en estos momentos hay una inflación de casi tres dígitos y por lo tanto, esa canasta ahora es insuficiente eh, el valor de esa canasta que fue lo que sirvió para calcular lo que se le iba a pagar a, la, a los trabajadores es muy insuficiente porque eh, comenzaron a haber nuevos precios y tarifas en toda la sociedad es cierto que una tarea de esta envergadura realmente de lograr eh, una tasa de cambio 1 a 24 para, la para toda la sociedad iba a ser complicado y era evidente que los resultados no se iban a obtener en, el, en, el, en un corto plazo pero sin embargo al menos en los primeros seis meses tenía que haber algún resultado que realmente hasta el momento los resultados no han sido los previstos eh, la otra sí. eh, la unificación monetaria realmente pudo o puede haber corregido eh, precios relativos basado en un tipo de cambio único fijo sobrevaluado y realmente generó muchas distorsiones en los precios relativos de la economía. Y eso permitió un estímulo al mercado informal de divisas. Es decir, el Estado cambia la economía a CUP, sin embargo, crea mercados en MLC, que después lo vamos a ver, pero no vende MLC. Y por lo tanto, las personas que no tienen oferta en los bienes en CUP, se suponía que si me vas a pagar un salario de base a una canasta, ese salario en moneda nacional me tenía que dar un poder adquisitivo determinado y no lo dio. ¿Por qué? Porque primero se, se produjo un incremento exagerado de tarifas de servicios públicos con un impacto inflacionario bastante grande y realmente eh, eh, la situación fue muy desfavorable, sobre todo lo, eh, como dice la gráfica, hubo un problema de secuencia. Eh, yo creo que la unificación monetaria eh, no está bien. Eh, la unificación monetaria es una medida de la esfera de la circulación. Eh, nosotros los marxistas hablamos de esfera de circulación, esfera de la producción. Eh, es así, lo que quiero decir que la unificación cambiaria tiene que ver con finanzas, con dinero, pero antes de adoptar esa, esa medida, había que haber adoptado medidas que hoy empiezan a, a, a establecerse, pero todavía no se ha publicado, que era la pequeña y mediana empresa, aunque no solo de ella. ¿Por qué? Porque yo creo, como hemos venido diciendo, tú tenías que impulsar la producción de la oferta de bienes y servicios. ¿Para qué? Para compensar esa, esa demanda que te venía. Si tú incrementas nominalmente los salarios, evidentemente sabrías que había mucha, mucho dinero, mucho dinero en la circulación a los pocos bienes. Por lo tanto, empieza primero a haber liberalizado todo lo que era aumento de la producción, que era sobre todo en el sector privado de la economía, las pequeñas y medianas empresas, etc., y no eh, eh, pasó. En, de, en resumen, eh, muchas de, la, de estas medidas que se han tomado en los últimos seis, siete meses, eh, en términos de tarifas, fueron que se modificaron eh, muy rápidamente las tarifas eh, eléctricas. 
eh, realmente, aunque el Estado dice que sigue subsidiando una parte de la población, realmente hubo una modificación de las tarifas excesiva. Eh, se establecieron tarifas, eh, podemos decir, eh, exclusivas o determinadas para la forma de gestión no estatal, pero eh, se separó la actividad de la vivienda y el tema del de pago de la tarifa residencial. Se produjo un aumento de las tarifas de agua a la población. Eh, realmente eh, se incrementaron eh, muchas tarifas del sector productivo, se establecieron todos los servicios jurídicos prestados por los bufetes. Es decir, en la esfera de los precios y tarifas se produjo un incremento en todas las áreas. Eh, después se dieron cuenta que hubo que hacer bonificación a tasas de peaje. Es imposible que, que una persona que en Varadero o en Santa Marta trabaje y tenga que venir a Matanza. No está bien la que estaba. Eh, eh, tenga que estar pagando ese, esa tasa de peaje tan grande y después rectificar. Lo que quiero comentarle es lo siguiente. Eh, ha habido aumentos de precios y realmente la forma que se ha expresado no es no ha sido la más correcta. Eh, hay que pasar la otra. O sea, se produjo una reducción eh, la otra. Se produjo una reducción del precio de, del gas licuado. Eh, ahí es, no estamos bien. Es la otra. La otra gráfica. Ahí. Ahí, ahí. Está, estaba bien. Se produjo una reducción del precio del gas licuado. Eh, primero, la cifra que apareció el primero de enero era que se iba a pagar eh, 213 el, el botellón. Después, eh, tres meses después, se bajó a 180. Pero lo que no se dijo es que antes costaba 7 pesos. Entonces, realmente la forma en que se presenta daba la idea de que el Estado aceptó la crítica de la gente y bajó. No, lo que subió, lo que subió de 7 pesos a 180. Eh, Aumentaron extraordinariamente los precios de los medicamentos. Después se rectificaron esos medicamentos. Eh, no, no estamos a tono con la, la otra. Ahí, ahí, ahí. Déjenlo ahí. Eh, realmente eh, se aumentaron los precios de las medicinas. Eh, el Estado después rectificó sobre todo los antibióticos y otros productos, pero sigue siendo precios ya bastante elevados. Eh, hubo mucha discordia, discordia y muchas críticas al tema de los comedores obreros. Eh, que ha sido típico en un país como Cuba, que las distancias son largas y la gente no está, como en otros países, dispuesto a ir a un comedor o a, a un restaurante, un, una cafetería para la vida diaria. Y entonces eh, llegaron a ponerse tarifas de un almuerzo alrededor de unos 100 pesos. Y ahí el Estado y el sindicato lograron establecer que por encima de 18 pesos el que tenía, tiene que pagar ese almuerzo es el centro de trabajo o una parte eh, de producción agropecuaria. En el tema de la producción agropecuaria, para estimular la producción de alimentos, el Estado in, implementó un paquete de 63 medidas. Algunas fueron ajustes y tarifas y precios que cada dos o tres meses se ajustan. Es decir, ayer se volvió a ajustar el precio que el Estado le está cobrando a los campesinos por el gasto de agua y el gasto de la electricidad, porque al precio que el Estado le estaba pagando a algunas producciones no le era rentable eh, y lo que estableció inicialmente fue una rebaja de los precios de, del servicio eléctrico y el cobro de agua. Ayer se volvió otra vez a reducir eso porque el campesino dice que no con los, la tecnología y los equipos gastadores de agua, etcétera, regar una plantación le cuesta muy caro por el precio del agua y a qué precio tendría que entonces poner los productos finales. Entonces ahí todavía... <risa> ha habido divergencia a tal punto que en la tarima de los cubanos eh, ha habido muchas dificultades en que lleguen esas 63 medidas. Es decir, no se manifiesta un aumento significativo de los productos, excepto lo que ha pasado en las últimas semanas, que el Estado le quitó el tope a los precios de los productos que había establecido y ahora comenzó de nuevo a, a, a brindarse o, o, o empiezan a aparecer en algunas tarimas o puestos de vianda algunos productos que el campesino lo había escondido porque no podía eh, venderlo a un precio, porque el Estado le había puesto un tope. Medidas absurdas, pero que se establecieron. La otra. Eh, el Estado también eh, quitó eh, algunas medidas en el tema de la comercialización. El papel de acopio ha mermado, 
pero todavía existen eh, muchas eh, dificultades. Eh, se establecieron precios descentralizados. Es decir, hay toda una serie de medidas en el tema de la agricultura, pero algo todavía está faltando. ¿Cuáles han sido los efectos para la población de esta tarea de ordenamiento? La otra. La otra slide. Please. Bueno, los efectos para la población. Realmente eh, ha habido una, una pérdida de poder adquisitivo de los salarios. Yo digo que eso no es un tema nuevo. Realmente en Cuba nunca los salarios han estado muy relacionados con los precios. Pero realmente en estos momentos los precios, eh, ha habido una inflación de un 500%. Eh, eh, ¿Por qué? Entre otras cosas porque se eliminaron los subsidios a todos los productos. O sea, aunque existe una canasta básica, ya los precios no son los de antes, ya todo está multiplicado. Eh, el que más se ha golpeado es el aumento de la electricidad. Eh, ha habido una escasez de productos en las tiendas liberadas en CUP. Por lo tanto, las personas no es que quieran moverse a las tiendas en moneda libremente convertida y que creó el Estado, es que no tienen otra opción. O sea, hay productos que se venden ahí que no se venden en otro lado. Y entonces las personas tienen que comprar esa moneda, o sea, el MLC, que puede ser yenes japoneses, puede ser euro, pero tienen que comprarla. ¿Dónde lo compra? En el mercado negro. ¿Por qué lo compra? Porque el Estado no vende, como pasó entre el año 93 en Cadeca, que el Estado sí vendía dólares, ahora no los vende. Entonces eso llevó a que realmente se estaba, y se está dando en estos momentos todavía 70 CUP por dólar. Lo más complejo fue después. Lo más complejo es que no se acepta ahora dólares en los depósitos de tarjeta. Entonces ha complicado aún más a, a la población que tiene ahora dólares o puede mandarle dólares, pero no lo puede depositar. Por lo tanto, tiene que exigirle a la familia que le mande en otra moneda. O sea, todavía una complicación adicional y eso eh, realmente es producto de esto que ha, que ha pasado. Estos siete meses de ordenamiento monetario yo creo que han bastado para que la complejidad de, se exprese en números de realidad. Es decir, no se observa en la economía y el presupuesto de empresas e instituciones eh, un resultado eh, que debería tener. Eh, realmente la rápida subida de los costos era, era un tema eh, inevitable. ¿Por qué? Porque Cuba es un país importador. Y por lo tanto, eh, lo que antes tú importabas y se lo vendías a las empresas nacionales a una tasa de uno a uno, ahora se lo tienes que vender una tasa de 1 a 24. Por lo tanto, esa empresa que compra esos productos importados tiene que multiplicar por 24 veces lo que antes le vendía al comercio minorista. Ya pueden imaginarse. Eh, lo curioso fue que en el propio Congreso del Partido, que fue cuatro meses después de la tarea de ordenamiento, ya el propio presidente cubano había dicho que el ordenamiento presentó problemas de instrumentación. Bueno, bueno si llevamos 10 años tratando de hacer esta tarea, como que presentó problemas de instrumentación. Y él se refiere a que hubo insuficiente preparación de directivos, que las normas no estaban bien, que no se comprendió. Bueno, al final, él dice que la forma en que se ejecutó no estaba, eh, eh, se alejaron mucho de los principios de la tarea. Pero, ¿qué se ha hecho? Lo, ¿Cuáles son los más, la parte de la población más afectada? Los jubilados. Los jubilados están ganando entre 1.528 o 1.700 CUP. Eso es muy bajo para los precios de Cuba. Eh, voy a hacer la anécdota. Un queso aguda de 2 kilogramos se pueden adquirir alrededor de 2.500 CUP. Entonces comparen donde un jubilado puede ganar eh, en un mes lo que, o el valor de un queso. Vaya, cosas así absurdas. Si usted quiere comprar un paquete de pollo de 2 kilogramos, tiene que pagar 300 pesos. Entonces, ya pueden comparar realmente si esa tarifa es baja o es alta. Recientemente, bueno, el Estado se dio cuenta y, y le, le dio 1.528 más a aquellos que habían sido, que son jubilados, pero que fueron combatientes de la revolución de una u otra forma. Ahora, al principio se creó, al principio, fíjate, estamos hablando como si fuéramos varios años, estamos todavía en los primeros siete meses de esa tarea de ordenamiento. Se establecieron 23 grupos salariales. Eh, donde el 80% de los trabajadores están en el, en el grupo del 1 al 10. ¿Cuál es el grupo 1? Bueno, el grupo 1 es el, que, el salario mínimo, 2.100 pesos. 2.100 pesos es el salario mínimo que se le puede pagar a un trabajador. Pero el grupo 10, que es la, más de la media del país, el salario son 3.260 CUP. 
y se plantea que el salario promedio del país es 3.800 CUP. Ahora, ahora se acaba de decir que van a desaparecer esos grupos salariales y que el directivo de una entidad puede pagar los salarios que quiera, basado en el porciento que tiene que dedicar a los salarios de su empresa. Pero bueno, ya tiene mayor discrecionalidad y yo creo que varíamos a, a ver cuáles son los resultados. A nivel empresarial, ¿cuáles son los, los resultados? Primero, es cierto, se ha clarificado la contabilidad, ya no hay contabilidad en dos monedas, pero lo más interesante es que muchas de las empresas que eran rentables ante esta tarea, o sea, ante el primero de enero, hoy tienen una situación de irrentabilidad, con, o sea, con valores negativos. El Estado ha tratado de subsidiar a muchas empresas, sobre todo en un primer año, eh, y ha sido muy complejo, muy complejo, muy complejo, eh, a, a, a tal punto que realmente eh, la a siete meses de haberse hecho esta tarea de ordenamiento, eh, se dijo oficialmente que hay más de 500 grandes empresas en Cuba con irrentabilidad. Entonces, un presupuesto que ya tiene un déficit de alrededor de un 20%, que ha tenido que ya subsidiar determinadas actividades, que tiene una COVID, que era un gasto que realmente no estaba eh, eh, controlado, o sea, que era un gasto eh, elevado, ahora puede ser que termine este año yo creo con más del 20% del déficit de presupuesto. Esto es una, una, una tarea bastante. ¿Qué medidas harían falta? La otra. Yo creo que hay que seguir flexibilizando eh, y tuve la oportunidad ya de leerme los documentos que van a salir por, en la caseta próximamente sobre las pequeñas y medianas empresas, las cooperativas, y realmente sí son cosas positivas. Eh, yo creo que hay interés en avanzar pero todavía cuando uno lo lee, ve que hay resistencia, mucha resistencia eh, ideológica a, a este tema. Eh, yo creo que, para qué repetir, que realmente el sector privado ofrece eh, a este proceso eh, muchas ventajas desde el punto de vista de creación de empleo, desde el punto de vista de aumentar la base productiva y por lo tanto mayor pago al, al presupuesto, eh, el nuevo listado de actividades es el CEP, tengo mis críticas eh, porque es el mismo listado para las tres formas de propiedad, cooperativas privados y, y estatales eh, me quedan cinco minutos eh, pero sin embargo todavía ese listado no da oportunidades para el sector de la alta calificación podemos llamar arquitectos abogados, economistas, etc están muy concentrados todavía en manualidades, en la esfera manufacturera eh, yo estaba viendo en el tema de, de, de la gráfica usted puede tener un taller de impresiones pero lo único que puede imprimir son eh, afiches comerciales o sea en el área comercial, usted no puede hacer un periódico, está bien no puede hacer una revista, perfecto no puede hacer un libro, pero no puedes hacer un folleto o sea no puedes imprimir nada solamente propaganda comercial, entonces yo voy a comprar una maquinaria, voy a hacer una pequeña mano de empresa solamente para diseño eh, divulgativo de publicidad. O sea, habría que, que, que ver esto, ¿no? Pasa otra ahí, si puede. Bueno, ahí eh, el permiso, eh, lo más interesante es que ya se aprobó. O sea, ya se aprobó en el Consejo de Ministros, después se aprobó en el Consejo de Estado. Y ayer se hizo una mesa redonda explicando en qué consisten los documentos. ¿Qué falta? Que saque el documento. Eh, de forma general, ¿qué ha pasado? No ha habido relación de los precios con los salarios. La tarifa eléctrica subsidia, sí, el 87% de la población. Entonces uno puede decir, bueno, está bien, qué país más generoso. Pero es que ese 87% de la población muestra un bajísimo nivel de equipo electrodoméstico en una familia cubana. Ejemplo, tener un solo aire acondicionado ya te saca de ese 87%, porque un aire acondicionado gasta 300 kilowatts. Entonces, si tú gastas 300 kilowatts, ya no estarías en ese 87%. Eh, se dice que el 22% de la población gasta menos de 100 kilowatts, pero eso es a, a bajar a la gente a la pobreza o subir a la gente, sacarlos a la pobreza. Pensemos qué nivel tiene de vida una persona que gaste 100 kilowatts. Eso es un bombillo, eso es un refrigerador. Entonces, el problema es que el ajuste tiene que ser hacia arriba, no penando a los que más han avanzado. 
y ha subido las tarifas telefónicas, ha subido la, la tarifa de transporte. Uh, Carmelo, bueno, de... um, Omar, you have about five minutes left. Ya. Yeah. Eh, ¿Qué ha pasado? Primero que no ha aumentado la oferta de productos agrícolas ni industriales. El poder adquisitivo de los ingresos de la población se ha deteriorado más que antes de comenzar la tarea de ordenamiento por la elevada inflación. Y la elevada inflación está relacionada con las carencias de productos. Tal vez si no hubiera estado la tarea de ordenamiento, tal vez hubiera habido también inflación, porque realmente la oferta, la producción es la que no aumenta. Eh, los mercados en MLC continúan desa 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 desabastecidos, pero están en mejores condiciones que los de moneda nacional. El dólar se cotizaba a 70 pesos por dólar. La tendencia es a un incremento, pero realmente esta, eh, en estos momentos hay cierto estancamiento. La zafra azucarera ha sido una de las más bajas de la historia de los últimos 100 años. Puedes pasar la, eh, por efecto de la COVID, el turismo casi ha desaparecido. Eh, apenas un 6% de los de lo, de lo, la otra diapositiva. Ha desaparecido. La población sigue sufriendo los los rigores de un periodo muy largo de restricciones de movilidad por la COVID, de cuarentena, es decir, yo observo la población que tiene fatiga y a la vez sufre de carencias alimenticias, vía disminución de oferta de determinados productos. Entonces, eh, son elementos de realmente de descontento que ya tenía la población, por lo menos desde el punto de vista económico, para no hablar de otros temas. Eh, vamos a la última. Vamos a pasar la última ya, Pablo. Yo creo que los márgenes de, de exactamente, los márgenes de maniobra de la economía cubana son más que reducidos, porque tenemos que decir que el bloqueo está intacto hasta el día de hoy, aunque se hagan gestiones. La COVID sigue presente y no logra disminuir, aunque no estamos en el peor momento de los 9.500 casos diarios, pero estamos en 8.000, casi lo mismo. Eh, por lo tanto, yo creo que la reforma económica tiene que ser integral y todavía más urgente y necesaria. Yo creo que ahora es el momento para, vamos a decir, dejar a un lado los prejuicios ideológicos presentes en algunos hacedores de política que frenan y siguen trabando el desempeño de, la, de los cubanos. Eh, yo creo que la competencia y el mercado son elementos imprescindibles en esta coyuntura. Los que se siguen oponiendo a esta sugerencia, yo les digo que acaben de mostrarme cómo van a aumentar la oferta de bienes y servicios en esta economía malherida y en agotamiento. Y yo creo que es eh, momento de terminar los discursos de barricadas, de revancha, de críticas uno con el otro. Y realmente eh, el, el mundo ha demostrado que realmente si no introduces más mercado, todos los experimentos van a ser fallidos. Muchas gracias. Fantástico. Gracias. Gracias, Omar. Muy gracias bien hecho. Muy bien hecho. Muy bien tiempo. Ah. Ok. Ok. Um, so now we will uh, move to um, we will move to um, Carmelo. Uh, let me get out of this slide here. I guess I can just stop sharing. And um, Gary, could you please uh, place my PowerPoint? Okay, great. Have we placed your PowerPoint? No. You have you have to shift to the. Yeah. You cannot okay. see the the PowerPoint, okay. Uh, Gary. Okay, just a second. I'm sorry, I'm. Uh, uh, here we go. Okay, you got it. No. You are blocking the PowerPoint. No, I thought I had it on there. Just hold on a second. Okay, can you put it full screen, please? Well, I'm trying to get it on first. Can you see it? It is on. It is on. You okay. have to put it full screen now. Full screen. Okay, hold on. I can't see it at all, so I don't know what's going on. Go to slideshow and press start slideshow. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You're right. That's right. 
Okay, no. screen. It's not yes. full screen, Gary. Ah, now it is, now it, okay. I am going to control the PowerPoint, so you don't have to worry about it. Hey, uh, good morning, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here again in the ASCII meeting this year uh, on the 30th uh, Congress. Before um, preparing my PowerPoint, I went through uh, the statistical yearbook of 2020. Everything is out except for uh, uh, foreign trade and, and uh, excuse me, tourism. Uh, and I, I cannot change the, the slides. Uh, uh, I cannot because change the slides. Because I'm sharing it. You have to put the slides. I have to change it. Okay, so I am going to discuss first the, the causes of the protests and the economic crisis. And uh, as Omar said already, Cuba is facing the worst economic crisis and, and, the, and protests since the 1990. And in my presentation, I am going to do three things. First, I will analyze the multiple causes of the crisis and the protests. Second, the factors that have facilitated the social explosion. And finally, the longest part of the presentation uh, to measure the magnitude of the current crisis uh, using multiple economic and social indicators. So first, in terms of the causes, the, we have that the extreme uh, ideological poles reduce uh, the cost to one. Uh, in the case of the Cuban government, they say it is the US embargo or the US blockade. In the, in the case of the extreme uh, exiles, uh, oh. conservative style in the communist system. And this is a really a simplification of reality because there are multiple price, uh, causes of, of these two problems. I'm going to enumerate them very briefly. First, it's an inefficient economic system. We have been saying this for years. This system has not worked anywhere in the world, including, including in Cuba. Uh, it's a system in, still in despite of the structural reforms introduced in 2007, there is a predominance of uh, central planning and the state ownership of the mix of production over the market and non-state ownership. The second is that there is a very severe uh, economic and humanitarian crisis in Venezuela that have been admitted by the United Nations in a very important uh, report. And by, because of that, Venezuela has drastically reduced its economic relationship with Cuba. Uh, the purchase of Cuban professional service, which is the first source of hard currency in the island. The second, the supply of oil on a very favorable uh, turn, and that covers about one half of uh, Cuban needs. And the third is direct investment that was totally stopped in 2018. And the third is the Cuban economic incapacity to finance its imports with its own export. And this is due to the fact that agricultural, manufacturing, uh, fishing, everything uh, have, have declined uh, as Omar already noted. Uh, for instance, the value of, uh, of Cuban total import exports contracted by 67% between 1989 and 2019, while imports increased and so did the merchandise deficit. Uh, you, we have a case of China. Uh, China, Cuba was selling China about $400 million. It was importing from China more than 2000. So there was a deficit in the trade of goods. And what China did, they reduced imports to Cuba to one half. That's the best example of uh, the Cuban incapacity to finance uh, imports with its own export. Now, the, the, the fourth uh, cause of the, of the crisis 
is the strong sanctions imposed, imposed by, by Trump, re reinforcing the US embargo or blockade. The first one is the application of Title VI of the embargo law. It used to be suspended every six months, including the first 18 months of Trump presidency. But Trump uh, enforced this Title VI. And what it does is allows <coughs> to sue, uh, to allow foreign companies to sue uh, the, the Cuban government uh, for trafficking in assets confiscated by, by the government. And this uh, imposition of Title VI have resulted in a paralyzation of new foreign investment and even departing from the island, some of the investors that were there. The second was the restriction of, of US flights to Cuba and also the banning of cruises that were taking most of the tourists. The third is the imposition of a top on remittances and eventually the banning uh, to the Western Union for sending those remittances uh, to Cuba because it was a military agency that was receiving the, those remittances. And the fourth and uh, final one, the tightening of sanctions to international banks that do transactions with Cuba. The fifth is the pandemic. Uh, that now is reaching the highest number of cases and death in Cuba, despite the inoculation of the population with two vaccines producing the island, there is a contradiction here. We have seen that when you have uh, the population vaccinated, the number of cases is reduced. In the case of Cuba, the opposite is taking place. So that is a strong indication that these vaccines are not effective and Cuba have no comply with the, with the protocols uh, to show that uh, efficiency. And because of uh, the COVID-19, tourism is, is significantly reduced as we are going to six to see. And also the mules that used to take money and goods to Cuba, they cannot travel there anymore. And finally, and Omar spent a, little, a lot of time on this, I am going to just mention it is a monetary and exchange rate unification. One thing that Omar didn't say, however, is that the Cuban government established a one-year transition. In this one-year transition, uh, enterprises that have losses and therefore will have to fire their employees, they, uh, they are safe during this one-year period uh, and, and uh, the government pr provides success uh, to them um, Omar mentioned uh, more than 17,000, uh, 17, 17 million, uh, the equivalent to $770 million uh, for a fund to continue providing subsidies to those enterprises. Could you change it, please? I cannot do it. Sure. Okay, now. I have identified four factors that have facilitated the protests. Uh, remember that the previous protest, the only one that have taken place in Cuba was a so-called Maleconazo in Havana in 1994. Uh, contrary to this, in which there was a reduced number, about 200 people, uh, this new protest uh, in June of this year have taken place in 50 or 60 cities of Cuba with many, much more demonstrators in Havana, South, South Gary, you, you, you move it back, please. I have not finished with this one. Sorry. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, there, are, there are significant differences and they, these are the four causes of this. First of, first of all, you have the internet and social networks. They did not exist in 1994 and they are now widely disseminated among the population. The second one is the closing of the pressure cook valve. Whenever faced with a dear economic situation, the Cuban government allowed the escape of the discontent as an alternative. That is not possible anymore uh, because uh, Barack Obama at the end of his administration uh, 
terminated the so-called dry feed, uh, wet feed policy that allowed people who arrived to, the, to land in the United States to, to receive asylum. That is no longer the case. And then Trump, of course, used this uh, to, uh, to reinforce his anti-immigration uh, policy. So there are very few people arriving, and most of them are sent back by the Coast Guard to Cuba. There is the absence of a charismatic leader. When the Maleconazo took place in Havana in 1994, Fidel Castro very quickly appeared in the middle of the demonstrators and convinced them to, to stop protesting. Of course, neither Raul, who is retired, nor Diaz Cane have such a charisma and population support. And, and finally, the alienation of the youth. This Johnson have been born after the, the revolutionary takeover. They do not share many of the ideas of the elderly. They are tired of the hardships and repeated uh, government promises that are not fulfilled. They, they wish for a better life uh, and handle social networks very, very efficiently. And finally, they support the, the new slogan, fatherland and life, opposite to Fidel Castro's slogan, fatherland and, and death. Okay, so here we have uh, the first uh, economic indicators of the social uh, and economic crisis. And we'll start with GDP, gross domestic product. It has been virtually stagnant since 19, uh, 2016. As Omar said, it declined by 0.2% in, in 2019. You can see that in the, in the graph, in the figure. And then by 10.9% in 2020. This is the biggest drop and have been said by the government since the, the economy declined by about 15% in 1993. That was the first, the worst year of the crisis of the 1990s. And in the, in the context of Latin America, this is the strongest fall after Venezuela that declined by 30%. It's much higher, the, the Q1 decline, uh, almost 11% at the regional average, which is about 7%. I have estimated that the annual average uh, in the period 2016 to 2020 has been minus 1.3%. So the economy used to be stagnant. No, the economy has been declining by 1.3%. What about 2021? The government official target is 6%. No way that they are going to meet that. In the first semester, as Omar said, the economy declined by 2%. So in order to, to get 6% in the second semester, we have to increase by 8%. And that's, that's impossible. Uh, and ECLA is projecting a growth of 2.2%. ECLA usually is very optimistic about Cuba, and then they have to uh, redo their calculations after Cuba publishes its own figures. And this uh, projection is the lowest rate after Haiti and, and Venezuela. So they are not going to do that. It will be either stagnant or, or declining. Uh, next, uh, next, please. Okay, now, now gross capital formation is very important because as higher uh, as a proportion of GDP, uh, higher economic growth is. In, in 1989, before the crisis of the 90s, it was 25% of GDP. Uh, you can see the graph here. In the year 2000, is 53.8%. That means that when you compare, this is an index, uh, index number, when you compare uh, the year 2020 with the year 1989, uh, there is a decline of almost half, 46 percentage points. Uh, the fiscal deficit in 2020, all this are, is from the Q1 uh, statistical year book. Uh, so it's 18 percent of GDP. That's the highest in the 1990s. For this year, it's estimated to be uh, 30%, so to be even higher. Inflation, there are different estimates, but uh, the range goes from 500% to 
This is the highest inflation in, in, the, in the region after Venezuela. And then monetary liquidity is important because it's, it's called M2. It measures uh, the circulation, the monetary circulation in the economy. And in 2020, for the first time, exceeded GDP since uh, 1993. It exceeded it by 121%, much higher than GDP. With this excess money in circulation, uh, CUP, there is virtually nothing to buy. It doesn't have persons in power. Next. Okay, now here are a series of indicators in, in terms of internal physical production, mining, oil, oil declined 22% between 2010 and 2020. Natural gas declined 28% between 2015 and 2020. And these have increased dependence on imported energy cure that have been able to reduce by about 10 percentage points uh, before. Uh, internally, there is a return of the blackouts, uh, seven plus hours, as in the crisis of the 1990s. I have followed uh, 24 key products uh, for our, since 1989 annually. Uh, in agriculture, livestock, seafood, and manufacturing. Out of these 24 in 2020, 19 declined. Only one out of these key products increased production slightly. The others, all of them declined. And when you compare 2020 with 1989, 12 of these 24 products, half of them were below the 1989 level. So it, it's, Cuba is below the production in 1989 before the crisis of the 1990s. And 12 are below previous production peaks. The sugar harvest, Omar mentioned that, uh, 7, 792,000 tons is one of the lowest in history. This should be compared with 8 million tons in the 1980s. Out of those 600,000, uh, have to go to domestic consumption and 400,000 have to be exported to China, meaning that there is a deficit in co internal consumption of 200,000 tons. Uh, that will be reduced. In the external sector, I already mentioned the decline in export value by 70, 67% between 1989 and 2020. Uh, imports have declined by 9%. The deficit balance of goods grew 130%. The surplus balance of goods and services. In the first comparison, we were using only goods. Now here we are combining everything, goods and services, including exports of professional services. Uh, that declined by 58%. It was negative for the first time in 2020. And this is because the value of professional services have shrank from almost 14% to 7% due to Venezuela's cut in the purchase of services and the part of Cuban doctors from all countries that uh, change uh, to conservative uh, leaderships. External remittances, that's the second hard currency source, declined by 35% between eight, 2018 and 2019. Tourism, in January, May 2020, there were 1 million tourists less. And according to Cuban figures, in this period, in May, May January, May 2020, there was only 11% of the tourists that there were in the same period in 2020. And gross tourism income, which is the third hard currency source, declined 80%. Uh, between 2017 and 2020. And hotel bed occupancy is about 48% in 2019. Of course, in, in, in 2020, it's much lower than that. Foreign direct investment, I already mentioned, is paralyzed because of the application of Trump Title VI, and, the, and Biden have not changed that policy yet. External debt, Cuba did not pay the second payment to the Paris club in October of 2019. The club imposed a 9% penalty. There, there were negotiations. 
there have been a postponement of, of the payment, but we don't know for how long. And this is a key uh, thing, and, and something quite important that is not very well known. The default on, on the debt renegotiated with, with Russia led to the suspension of uh, Russian investment projects in Cuba. International Reserve, they are not published, but they should be at a very low level or visually exhausted due to the crisis. There are no resources to deal with rising import costs and its limits, and there is a limited to fiscal policy space as Omar mentioned. And finally, Cuba has not a lender of last resource because it doesn't belong to the IMF, the World Bank, or the Inter-American Development Bank. Next. Next, please. Okay, now social indicators on employment. One of the most interesting thing is that the labor force participation rate have fallen from 76% in 2011 to 65% in 2020 and is declining. Open unemployment in 2019 was 1.3%. This is one of the lowest in the world, certainly in Latin America. But I have measured on their employment at 29%. And this is this uh, excess labor in the state enterprises that, that Raul Castro tried to get rid in the period 2010, 2015. But he also did only dismissed 500,000 workers out of, uh, of a total a uh, surplus of 1.8 million. So there is all that labor is still in the economy. And the unification uh, process, monetary unification, should get rid of that. As, as enterprises with losses are shut down, they, they will have to, these workers will be unemployed. And that's one of the reasons why the government put a one year transition, the enterprises are uh, signed commitment saying in this year, we are going to eliminate those losses. I have serious <laughs> doubts that they will be able to do so. So the question is what is they are going to do after the one year transition uh, ends? Is that all unemployment, this guy's unemployment is released, uh, then the government ha have to expand private enterprises, self-employment, uh, service cooperative, all this, and Omar already mentioned uh, that uh, it's not clear whether the new, the new law of enterprises is, it will be guaranteeing them and allow them to expand fast enough to absorb all that surplus labor. And here you have the real pension and, and the real salary. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the salary is in, in, the, uh, in blue, is the blue curve. Uh, there is a decline. Everything is measured with 1989 equals to 100. So you can see that there is a, an increase, but it's still in, in 2020, and this, this was about 45% below the purchasing power of uh, 1989 before the crisis. And the, the orange uh, curve, this, uh, these are the pensions. Uh, they did a little better, uh, but it's still they are about 42% below the level of 1989. Next. Okay, healthcare. I have just published a, a, an article with uh, Sergio Diaz Briquet in the Journal of Latin American Studies in London, in which we showed uh, the magnitude of the health crisis in Cuba. There is a significant number of hospitals that have been uh, shut down by what all the rural hospitals were shut down, uh, as well as polyclinics, post beds per 1,000 inhabitants, and health personnel, except for doctors. That in, in keep growing up, but about half of them are abroad, particularly primary healthcare doctors. And, the, and a very interesting figure, the maternity, maternal mortality, the decline increased from 32.6% in 1990 to 43.8% in 2018. At the same time, the infant mortality keeps uh, declining. 
Cuba doesn't publish any data on poverty. It's the only country in Latin America that doesn't do that. That no, you cannot find that figure in any international or regional organization. Simply it's blank. Uh, but we have plenty of information and, and data that shows that they are, have increased significantly uh, since the uh, structural reforms of Raul Castro began in 2007. In this situation, social assistance should be expanded to protect the vulnerable, the poor. But the opposite happened in 2005 and 2020, as shown in the figure. As you can see, you, you have two indicators here. Uh, the, the, the orange one is the social assistance beneficiaries per 1,000 inhabitants. It goes down from 4.3 to 1.7. That's like less than one third. And the other indicator is a, the cost measured by the state budget of social assistance in relation to GDP. And that declined from 2.2% of GDP to 0.3% of GDP. So again, instead of expanding uh, this, the minimum social protection net, it has been contracting. Uh, and that is certainly not helping with, with, with poverty. Next. So the final one, and then we have the food scarcity already. Omar uh, spoke uh, about this. I showed the decline in, in agricultural cattle and fishing production, but also it, there is a decline in food imports due to the shortage of foreign exchange. Uh, and rationing is, you have less and less products through rationing, uh, which is subsidized by, by the government, meaning that they are sold at, at, the, at a price below cost, but less and less products are through the libreta. And once they are free in the, in the market, set the price by supply and demand, the price increases four, five, six times much more now with the, with the monetary unification. And then the state-owned hard currency store have a profit of 240%, but due to the crisis and the, good, the cut in good imports, uh, imp, good imports in, in 2020 were cut by 15% in relation to, to 20, 2019, there is left food on the shelf of this uh, estate shops in hard currency. And that is impossible to buy food and medicine with the CUP as, uh, as Omar mentioned. Typical items of a Cuban diet such as rice, beans and pork are not found or they cost a lot. Black market is rapidly growing and also its prices. Imported chicken pound at $1 is sold seven times. And pow powder meal that was only sold to children and the elderly grew 120 times. These are official figures. So my conclusions, and this is not mine. I mean, Omar said this. If you go into, in, into the internet, most Cuban economists, academics have been saying this. Omar said it very clearly. Before the unification, the government have to do the restructuring which it was not done. Raul Castro measure fell very short of that. If they have done that, expanding the non-state sector significantly, there will have been an increase in the supply and the government won't be uh, suffering the problem that is suffering now. Now, of course, in the middle of this crisis, they cannot do that. Everything is going down. They should have done it before, but they didn't do it. And another thing there was, a golden opportunity for the government to start the dialogue. And unfortunately, it didn't do it. Uh, you should recall the meeting of about 200 people in front of the Ministry of Culture. Uh, the Vice Minister promised that there will be some negotiations that the government didn't do it. And now with the protest, instead, instead of opening for a dialogue, a respectful dialogue, the government, what it did was to repress uh, the demonstrators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmelo. It was an excellent presentation. Um, 
gosh, what a mess. <laughs> okay, um, coming up is Jorge Dominguez, who's well known to all of us. Um, he's got a very interesting, I read a slideshow last night, and very interesting comments and great perceptions of what's going on is, um, well, I'll leave my comments to later. Um, Larry, um, can you run Jorge's um, um, PowerPoint? I need to spend a little time working up my questions for the end. Yes, happy to do that. Thank, Thank you. you, Larry. All right, one sec. Um, okay. Can you all see it? I, yes, I now can. All right. Should I begin? Yes, you okay. can. Okay, and Larry, you're going to flip the, the slides, right? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, thank you. So you put Larry. a full screen, Larry, before uh, Jorge start. Yeah, hold on a sec. That looks good to me. Can you see it now? Full? Not now. Yeah. Let me go back to where I the moment I go was just fine. Naturally. Uh, let me try to go back. That's what happens when there are too many cooks. <laughs> right. Give me a sec. Let me try this again. Apologies. No problem. You're doing you're doing a wonderful job. Yeah. <laughs> Usually when I tell people I'm about to fire. <sighs> there. Sick. All right. Get the whole thing back up. All right. Here's your PowerPoint. Share screen, try that again. And you should be on. Okay, now it looks good. All right, it's all, all, it's all you. Okay, may I begin? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, thank you uh, very much to the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy for this uh, opportunity. Uh, to present uh, my thoughts this morning. And it is a pleasure to share a panel with, <clears throat> with Gary, uh, uh, Carmelo Omar. And I wanna thank Larry for his uh, invaluable uh, technical support. Uh, my topic is the triumphs and failures of bureaucratic socialism in Cuba uh, over the last uh, uh, three years. Um, next slide. Um, my uh, general perspective is I want to think about what was Raul Castro's presidential project. Uh, and he called it uh, the achievement of a prosperous, sustainable, and irreversible socialism. Uh, it rested on two pillars. Uh, one was the reform of the economy. That was slowing down in uh, the middle of the decade. It was then blocked uh, at the time of the 2016 Party Congress. And in the years that followed, uh, Omar and Carmelo have done a terrifying but excellent job in describing uh, the nature of the problems uh, and the reasons uh, for it. So I will not be addressing that topic. Instead, I want to focus on the second pillar, which was the attempt to institutionalize the political regime uh, through depersonalization and also through the establishment of new rules. Examples of the new rules was to shift from a single uh, top executive, Fidel or Raul, to a plural executive with the president of the Republic, a prime minister of the government, and a pre president of the Council of State. Uh, other rules would be 
age 60 is now the maximum before anyone can join the Central Committee of the Communist Party. At age 70 is a more discretionary rule to discouraging uh, high office uh, uh, holding uh, for those who are, for example, my age. To me, an interesting feature of the 2021 Party Congress is that it may have anticipated in some respects uh, motivations of the protests uh, uh, in July last month. A common slogan of protesters across Latin American countries is in Spanish, que se vayan todos. Uh, one way to think about what the April 2021 uh, Party Congress did is que se vayan casi todos. Not that all the leadership uh, would go away or be fired, but that uh, almost all might go. Among the departures from the Political Bureau and the Central Committee just a few months ago was not only Raul Castro, but the decades long Organization Secretary of the Party, Jose Ramon Machado, uh, former Interior Minister and Jack of all trades, Ramiro Valdez, two of Cuba's most senior and long serving generals, Leopoldo Sintra and Ramon Espinosa, uh, Vice President Marino Murillo, nominally responsible for the unsuccessful economic reforms, and Havana uh, Province uh, First Secretary of the Party, Mercedes Lopez Acea. Uh, Next slide, please. But if one thinks more broadly, not, not just about individual names, but about a political process, uh, one realizes that the 2021 Party Congress replaced uh, a significant number of Cuba's most senior officials. Six out of 10 of the members of the Central Committee of the Party were replaced. About half of the political bureau members were replaced. About half of the first secretaries of the Communist Party in the provinces were replaced. These are these, the first secretaries, are the key local executives. They, they really are the most significant uh, uh, officials at that level. And then more dramatically, uh, the entire secretariat of the Central Committee of the Party was replaced. Uh, and nearly all of the generals, Cuba's most senior generals, who were also members of the Central Committee, were replaced. Next slide, please. Uh, dramatic as some of these changes are, it is a little more muted if one asks the questions, how many new members uh, there are? And that's because the size of the different bodies have changed from the 2016 to the 2021 Party Congress. Uh, and I wanna use the 2016 Party Congress as my benchmark. So if one asks how many new members there were in 2021, uh, well, it turns out to be that the rate is the same for the two party congresses. If you're looking at the Central Committee, if you're looking at the Political Bureau, or if you're looking at the first secretary of the party in the provinces. About half of the central committee uh, gets replaced, about a third of the political bureau gets replaced, and about two thirds of the provincial first secretaries get replaced. The big changes, and these are not insignificant, but they're more clustered, is that in 2016, the majority of the secretariat remained in place, whereas in 2021, everyone was new. Uh, in 2016, uh, all but one of the generals remained on the Central Committee, whereas in 2021, nine out of 10 are new. Uh, the 2016 uh, pattern had been the normal one. The military remained in place unless they died from Central Committee con uh, member of Congress to Congress. This is a new change. This is a new pattern. I want to return to it in a few uh, minutes. Um, I do want to name what I think might be rising stars, at least for the time being. One is Prime Minister Manuel Marrero, uh, who has taken the lead at explaining practical problems more effectively than many others. Another one has been Economy Minister Alejandro Hill, who unlike his predecessor this time seems to be pushing 
some of the economic reforms. Another one is the new party organization secretary, Roberto Morales, uh, once a uh, minister of public health. And then two recently retired, formerly retired uh, brigade generals, uh, the secretary of the Council of Ministers, Jose Amado Ricardo Guerra, and the head of the octopus, uh, the conglomerate known by its acronym, GAESA, uh, um, Luis Rodriguez uh, Lopez Calleja. Next slide, please. Uh, I do want to then address the next topic, uh, uh, whether to constrain state and party oligarchies. The problem, as I think uh, Raul Castro had seen it, was that a very small number of the same people had been making all the decisions. And when Fidel was president, of course, he made them all by himself. Uh, moreover, the ministers were unaccountable because so many belonged to the Council of State. So it was the same human being who made the proposal and then also had the authority to approve his own proposals. And the question is, uh, that is insufficient uh, accountability. And another one was that the party leaders who also served as ministers were focused too much on administrative detail when they ought to have been focusing on strategic political questions. The risks, however, in breaking up some of these oligarchies or at least in weakening them is that if you reduce the overlap between high party officials and council of ministers members, you may be reducing the clout that any one minister may have from day to day. And you are requiring many more consultations and that delays decision-making. I think some of that may have been happening already. Moreover, if you reduce the overlap between high party officials on the one hand and council of state members on the other, you also may be lowering the clout, uh, the collective clout of the entire Council of State. And I think that may happen as well. And finally, if you're reducing the overlap between the senior members of the Communist Party uh, and any of, of the Council of Ministers of the Council of State, you may be impairing the party's capacity to lead. From my perspective, that probably is a good thing, but from the perspective of Raul Castro enacting these changes, that would be problematic. Nevertheless, the decision was to reduce um, substantially the overlap across the board. And that's what my next table uh, shows. Uh, next slide, uh, please. Uh, first, the constitution of 2019 prohibited overlap between the Council of State and the Council of Ministers. That's why in 2021, you see on the first rows two zeros. That overlap has disappeared altogether. If you simply glance at the other numbers, you see that compared to the 2016 party Congress moment, in 2021, overlaps fell all across the board between the political bureau and the council of ministers, between the central committee and the council of ministers, uh, between the political bureau and the council of state, between the central committee, uh, all the political bureau members in the council of state, uh, and so on. Nevertheless, uh, some of the overlap remains very high. For example, in the council of state, nearly two thirds of its members are members of the central committee. But what you do see is Raul Castro making a significant dent on oligarchic overlap constraint, uh, whether that will work and serve his vision of a socialist regime well or badly, only time will tell. Next slide, please. I do also want to address um, um, strategies to try to provide accountability and career incentives. And I want to return to the question of the first party secretary in the provinces because these really are key officials. One way to think about what has happened is the decision to replace those who were ineffective, to keep those that were essential and to promote the best, the best in terms of the perspective from Raul and from Miguel Diaz-Canel. 
Uh, half of them, as I already indicated, were replaced as, not only as first secretary of the party, but they were also ousted from the Central Committee. The three in the easternmost provinces that have been key essential uh, support for the political regime, the provinces of Tunas, Granma, and Santiago, what those of us in my age used to know as Oriente province, they remain both on the Central Committee and as first secretaries of the party. Three of them were promoted and they are no longer first party secretaries in the provinces. Two rose to the national secretary and one became a uh, deputy prime minister. And then two were promoted, uh, but they remain as first secretaries um, uh, in, in the city of Havana and in the province of Artemisa. So you see the attempt to hold many accountable, but also to reward those who have done uh, a good job from the regime's perspective. Next slide, please. Uh, just want to return to the point of the generals. Uh, generals used to hang on if they were senior generals as members of the Central Committee. Uh, those who retired often remain there. The slide gives you a fair amount of detail I just want to highlight the point that the 2021 Party Congress is the first one to affirm the party's supremacy over military appointments and dismissals. This is an important consideration when one thinks about the future of Cuba. Many of you, uh, myself as well, uh, had taken note of the persistent clout of these generals. Uh, year after year, uh, decade after decade, this seems to have changed. What the impact of this change will be, only time will tell, but it's important to take note that this year, 2021, is different uh, with regard to civil military relations than from what we had known in years past. Next slide, please. Just a side moment, stepping away from the party Congress to look at the electoral institutions. The word electoral, if you want, uh, you can put in quotation marks, namely the National Assembly and the Council of State. One noteworthy change during the first two decades of the 21st century has been that the number of Afro-descendants in the National Assembly and in the Council of State has risen considerably the number of women in both of those institutions have risen considerably, and the median age on the Council of State has fallen appreciably. Given that Cuba's median age has been rising, then you will understand my comment that you now have, certainly on the Council of State and on the National Assembly, a fairly close match between the demographic distribution of Cuba's population on the one hand and the demographic the, uh, distribution in these institutions with regard to race, gender, and age. Next slide, however. One puzzle, I had not expected this finding when I began this uh, research. Uh, one puzzle is how badly the top leadership in Spanish, they call themselves La Dirección Nacional, how badly they use their own sponsored National Assembly elections to identify which political leaders might be more popular or less unpopular, and thus choose those more popular for the Council of State, which would seem to me to be a good normal use of an authoritarian regime, so-called election. Now, bear in mind how Cuba conducts National Assembly elections. Everyone on the ballot will automatically be elected. These are uncontested elections. There are no multiple parties, only one. There are no multiple candidates for the same seat. However, these candidates, assured of victory, are clustered in districts. Each district has between two and five candidates. A voter, therefore, may vote yes for everybody, and lots of people apparently do that, but a voter also could vote blank or annul one's vote or vote selectively. I can vote for candidate A, but I do not want to vote for candidate B. 
And that allows me therefore to see what is the distribution of popularity or lack thereof, votes received. And then you can ask, do those who receive more votes uh, get chosen for the Council of State? And the big surprise is that the answer is not really. So in 2018, uh, three quarters of the members of the Council of State did not top the election in their municipality. If they were running for a member of the US Congress, they would have been defeated. Uh, even in 2013, half did not top their municipality. Uh, it only got worse in the more recent national elections. Suppose the votes were counted not as they are in the United States, first past the post uh, gets to win, but proportional representation. And that the requirement were that you need to score at least in the top half of the vote receivers in your province. In 2018, uh, more than half of the members of the Council of State fell in the bottom half of the vote receivers in the province. They would have been ineligible for the Council of State. So the Cuban top leadership is remarkably unable to use its own sponsored elections to actually identify and promote those who do better. And electoral performance of Council of State members worsened between the last two national elections. And that might have been an early warning sign of the upcoming protest if the leadership had paid attention. Next slide, please. So what overall, Raul Castro, I think, succeeded in enacting many noteworthy institutional changes, and that was a procedural triumph. A notable failure is what I just discussed, the inept use of authoritarian regime national elections to select the top leaders. Only time will tell where the institutional changes matter substantively as well, and if so, how, but what we do know is that uh, in July 2021, those institutions failed. Next slide, please. And a few words on the July 2021 protest. There were historic, as I think everyone on this uh, uh, webinar would know, because there were interurban, uh, perhaps um, three dozen cities and towns were involved across all the provinces. They involved thousands of people. The key diffusion instrument, as Carmelo mentioned a few minutes ago, was the internet. And therefore the key innovative repressive instrument was to cut off internet access. Uh, one recurrent feature is to use interior ministry special troops. They were used on the Malecon in, the, in uh, uh, the summer of 1994, they were used again. The key absence, as Carmelo once again just noted, was Fidel. And I do want to note two secondary but important external actors, out of Cuba individuals and groups and robots acting through the internet and Chinese technology uh, that Atexa, the Cuban telephone company, used to block internet access and to facilitate surveillance. I do want to highlight very important issues that you all know and that Omar and Carmelo uh, very uh, uh, thoughtfully have emphasized, but that perhaps controversially, I think are unlikely as explanations because I keep asking myself the question, if they were the explanations, why did the protest not occur before? So I don't think that decade long economic stagnation awful as it has been, helps to explain this event. Protests should have occurred long ago, if that were the explanation. The delayed economic reforms, uh, scandalous as that delay is, uh, well, they should have provoked protests before. Uh, the long lasting uh, US uh, economic sanctions and other sanctions, they should have pro um, generated protests before, they did not. The authoritarian political regime. You know, we have to go back to 1994 to find anything 
uh, of the salience of what just occurred. Not enough of an explanation. Or oh, the pandemic, remember, it, that kept people confined, not in gatherings, not in the streets. Now, these and several other factors were voiced in various protests, but that does not persuade me that they were the explanations for the protests. So when I try to explain at least to myself what the protests were, let me summarize them. Next slide, please. So I think it is not the long-term economic stagnation, but the sudden sharp economic downturn and the very low prospects for recovery. Uh, the economy did not just stagnate, it nosedived. That's different. Uh, you need variation. You need a change to explain a change. Constants do not explain change. Second important change was the dramatic inflation spike in 2021 that both Omar and Carmelo have noted. That is very different. The pandemic spike, not 18 months ago, the pandemic sp spike just a few weeks ago. Cuba had been one of the better worldwide managers of the pandemic. Now it is one of the worst uh, affected by the pandemic. Uh, it has one of the highest rates for population and that peaked in June, just a few days before the explosion of the protest. The crisis in the summer energy supply induced protests in 1994 and surprise, surprise in 2021, uh, the electric power blackout, the Apagones reappeared late June, 2021. And if it's hot, your air conditioning and your fan are not working, you wanna be out on the street racing hell. There might even have been, I'm a little less sure about what I'm next going to say, a reform moment. Or another way to say the same thing is, could I be pushing through the open door? So the government, as Omar and Carmelo uh, noted, launched the monetary reform in January 21. Well, so maybe if I'm unhappy, maybe this one big reform, maybe I can protest and push another one. That's the, what's behind this reasoning. Another possibility is the multiple changes, the multiple adjustments in the initial policies. Omar Verlaini's presentation dwelled very well with many of these. So if the current policy I don't like, let me raise hell and the government will change it again, whether it is this rate or that rate, that's a possibility. The turtle paced uh, economic reforms, but in June, they proposed reforms on the private sector um, uh, began to move forward. So perhaps the process said, let me push through that open door. Less sure about this, but it's worth thinking about. And then what really turned out to be the inept top leadership response. Next slide, please. So uh, after the party Congress in April, the Escanela and the leadership misallocated leadership time and leadership attention. They spent an enormous amount of time consolidating Diaz Canel's hold on the party machinery. They visited every province, Diaz Canel and the entire party secretariat, focusing on internal communist party issues, choosing new local communist party leaders. They went on to publish long, opaque, uninspiring, boring documents that read like a checklist produced by committees. Why? because they were addressed not at the public, but at a narrow set of their immediate subordinates. They failed to explain in any clear way the energy generation breakdown to the public. They failed to explain the COVID-19 breakdown of the healthcare system, uh, particularly uh, in uh, June and early July in the provinces of Havana, Matanzas, Ciego de Avila, and Santiago. Uh, it is dramatic to see in the early videos, not in all of them, in the early videos, how unprepared the national police was to cope with these protests. More generally, there, the leadership had the mistaken illusion of political stability. Next slide, please. And so uh, you observe the breakdown of the Communist Party and mass organizations as instruments to communicate up what it is that people are thinking. And seemingly only after the protest did President Miguel Diaz-Canel 
discover and listen. And at first, again, not later, but at first, he distinguished three kinds of people to whom he said he should pay attention. One was people who were in really bad shape. They did not have the things that they needed. And Omar gave you some detail, and Carmelo did as well, on poverty and economic hardship. That's one category. The second category, Diaz-Canel said, was revolutionaries. These are not people overthrowing the regime. These are revolutionaries, but they were confused. They didn't know what to think. The third category was revolutionaries who were not confused, but they wanted explanations about why were things unfolding the way that they were. Instead of trying to follow those first sensible instincts, as Carmelo said at, at the close of his remarks, actually listening and engaging in a dialogue, including with people like this, the government panicked and turned to repression. Repression is always a sign of political ineptitude. And he called upon every revolutionary to come out on the streets to confront counter-revolutionary elements. Uh, pretty much a president of the Republic calling for a civil war in his own country. Uh, he called out the interior ministry special troops and now with the police to beat up and to arrest hundreds across the provinces throughout the nation. Moreover, what I think may turn out to be counterproductive by placing official blame of everything on the United States, whether it's government of activists uh, and to blame the US sanctions policy that after all increases the likelihood that US sanctions policies will remain in, press, in, in place. Grangma, the official newspaper, is persuading the White House that sanctions finally, finally work. They finally advance regime change in Cuba. I don't think that is what the Cuban government and party leadership actually want, but that is what their choice of explanation may facilitate. One question, to use a word that Fidel invented uh, in the 1980s, rectificación, uh, are the protests already succeeding? Uh, just a few days ago, on August 6, uh, the Council of State finally approved the changes in, uh, for small and private, uh, private sector enterprises and for non-agricultural cooperatives that should have been enacted a decade ago. Uh, uh, they now may no longer be enough, um, but at least it is a baby step long overdue forward. Overall, uh, to me, what is noteworthy is the political ineptitude, the reliance on force over politics of a leadership that panicked, that did not know what to do. Next slide, please. Uh, Jorge, you need yep. to wrap it up. Sorry, I need to be done? Yeah, you need to be done. Okay, so uh, my last slide just simply has scenarios, um, one rosier than others, one more complicated than others. Uh, I think Larry will make my PowerPoint available on the uh, ASCII website, and that's great. Uh, but ultimately, I do want to mention what is the one unavailable option that may be in the minds of more than one of you. The government cannot now dismiss many inept government and party leaders because uh, it already replaced them last April or before. Alternatively, many more inept government and party leaders, incumbents, could go. And that is the uh, cartoon Pogo message reminding President Miguel Diaz-Canel, quote, we have met the enemy and he is us. Or if you prefer a more literary allusion, Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, act one, scene two, um, line 145, has Cassius saying, the fault, dear Brutus, lies not in our stars, but in ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. You deserve the reputation you have as a first-rate political analyst. And I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. 
Um, okay, so that wraps up the presenters. We have about a half an hour for questions. Um, anybody has questions, please click on your Q&A and, um, and, and, and post them there. In the meantime, um, I got a couple of questions. As has been was pointed out uh, by both Carmelo and um, Omar, the government now is having a great deal of difficulty providing social assistance. The shortages of food or basic essentials, medicines, et cetera, hospitals are closed. At the same time, the government is trying to sweep up as much as much foreign exchange as possible. This leaves little for the expanded private sector. No money for investment, no money for imports. So the question I have is, and apparently, we don't know, but apparently they have close to zero um, uh, foreign reserves, although we never know the answer to that question because um, they don't publish them. So my, my question is, looking at it from the Cuban government perspective, not from our perspective as people who criticize the policies, but from the Cuban government perspective, they need to get as much foreign exchange as possible to satisfy the basic human needs of the population. While at the same time, they need to encourage the protective sector. How do they do that? I mean, we don't have any lender of last resort. Um, Gary? Yeah, Can you repeat your question, the last part of your question? You are saying that where the government is going to, to get the hard currency that they need to face a situation. Is that your question? That's the question. And again, it's this, they have this trade-off between making foreign exchange available to the productive sector versus trying to meet basic human needs. And without a lender of last resort, what do they do? Yeah. So, are, is it open for answers? It's open for any comment from anybody. Yes. Okay. The possibilities of getting hard currency. Uh, well, the chances that Cuba will enter the World Bank the International Monetary Fund, uh, eventually the Inter-American Development Bank are visually zero. I mean, this, this, this is a long process. Instead of uh, supporting the Obama policies as uh, Biden said during the electoral campaign, he is supporting the Trump uh, policies. And therefore, I don't see any chance of Cuba getting uh, loans uh, from these international and regional financial organizations. Uh, now, what about uh, allies? Well, I, I show, for instance, that the, the Chinese uh, reduced uh, their export to Cuba to one half because the Cubans were not exporting anything to them. They, they were having facing a, an increasing deficit in, in, in the trade of goods. Uh, the Chinese, uh, for I don't think that they would be supporting the Cuban government, uh, was huge amount of money. The Russians uh, reacted to Cuba and not paying the debt by suspending the, the investments. Uh, Russia trade with, with Cuba is ranked about seventh uh, in terms of uh, trade volume. Uh, they are not in very good economic situation either. So I, I don't think the Russians are going to come and help Cuba. So the chance of the United States that seems to be a possibility so far have not worked because Biden actually 
is try try to confront the Cuban government because of the, of the protests. So all this external, but well, you have of course uh, elections in Peru, and, and a leftist leader who, who is sympathetic to Cuba was elected, but. Peru doesn't have a lot of resources uh, to replace uh, Venezuela, and, and Venezuela is in, in terrible shape. It's the worst economy in, in Latin America. Actually, performance of Venezuela is worse than Cuba. <laughs> it's a, a unique case in which the subsidizer is worse than, than the government subsidized. <laughs> so Venezuela is cutting instead of providing. So the only chance that they have is to do it internally, which is what Omar and all the Cuban economists have been saying for decades. And then here comes uh, the law of enterprises that was mentioned to Jorge Dominguez. I, I was laughing the other day because uh, uh, a Cuban economist in, 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 in Colombia, uh, Mauricio, uh, is sending a desperate call to, to Cuba and friends saying, can you send me the, the law? Because I, I, have, I cannot find it. Now, Omar said, I do have the documents now. I, can, I have to confess, I have been unable to get them. So this is such an important document and it's not available. Why? And of course, uh, Jorge, it's not enough to enact the law is how the law is going to be implemented. And we don't have any chance, at least I have not been able to do that, to analyze the law and see really this going to, as the Cuban said, soltar las fuerzas productivas, <laughs> open up the productive forces in Cuba in order to increase production and supply or not. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, I've been working 60 years of the Cuban economy. I don't have a document. I, do, I, cannot have, I cannot express my opinion in terms of whether this law has a, law have a chance to work or not. So this is a problem. Well, only one question, uh, Jorge. You, are excellent, was pre, you have an excellent presentation. But when you say that one of the detonants of the process was a sharp decline in, in, in GDP in 2020, well, the decline in 1993 was three po percentage points uh, larger and nothing happened. So I would like to know what, what your answer to that is. Déjame, ¿puedo hacer una aclaracióncita? ¿Algunos detalles? Por favor. Mira, coincido plenamente con Carmelo lo que ha planteado. Eh, hay barreras eh, que son objetivas, infranqueables, que no dependen de Cuba y Carmelo lo ha explicado muy bien. Pero sin embargo, hay pequeñas cosas que tampoco resolverán el problema completo, pero lo, lo, lo minorizan, o sea, lo, lo aminoran. Eh, ¿Por qué tú tienes que importar a través de una empresa estatal? ¿Por qué hay cuántas cosas? ¿Por qué el comercio minorista tiene que ser solo estatal? O sea, cuántas cositas. Y voy a poner solo dos ejemplos. Los dos aviones que llegaron de Rusia con donaciones trajeron cada, en cada uno 44 toneladas, es decir, 88 toneladas. En seis días de permitir la libre importación de alimentos, aseo y medicina, entraron 112 toneladas. Entonces, hay un ejemplo ahí claro. Y estoy hablando de pasajeros con limitaciones de vuelo, con toda una serie de cosas. ¿Qué potenciales hay que un familiar de Estados Unidos le mande seis cajas de vino a un cubano que tiene un negocio privado y pague los impuestos por esas seis cajas de vino? Son ingresos que entran al Estado poco a poco. Pero mientras que tú tengas la concepción estatalista, descentralizada, hay muchas cosas que se podrían mejorar. Y no digo que el Estado esté frenando, el Estado está haciendo nuevas cosas, pero todavía lo hace muy gradual, como si el tiempo fuera eterno. Y el ejemplo manifiesto es el 11 de julio. La gente no puede seguir esperando que tú le digas que en el 2030 que se van a resolver problemas. Eh, 
la gente quiere ahora, porque la hora de él es 30 años esperando. Entonces tienen que entender que realmente tú tienes que agotar todo lo posible, que te pueda dar pequeños recursos. Y yo estoy seguro que, que, que muchos privados cubanos podrían tener suficiente divisa para importar directamente, para comprar en la zona económica de desarrollo especial. Entonces, siguen eh, todavía, aunque dicen que sí, pero siguen todavía frenando, el Estado sigue por en medio. ¿Por qué no puede haber una tienda privada en Cuba? ¿Cuál es, cuál es la ideología que trae eso? Que yo pueda tener una paladar, pero no puedo tener una tienda. O sea, son cosas ahí que realmente no se justifican eh, hoy en el don año 2021. Es lo que estoy diciendo. Entonces, en el corto plazo, hay pocos que que el gobierno puede hacer, pero puede hacer algunas cosas sobre la importación de este film. Um, uh, Carmelo, sobre la, la new laws to small and medium enterprises, the government said they were going to publish them in the Gazette. Um, of course, they haven't appeared. They've been talking about new laws for small and medium enterprises for at least a decade, and they can't seem to produce them. It's interesting to me that they say they had now formulated those rules, but they still can't seem to get them published. It's, it's a very curious system. And I think it, it goes to some extent to what Jorge argues that we may be getting a very inept leadership in the, in the, at the top and a leadership that doesn't really understand that what needs to be done. Um, Carmelo, a very quick question. How did you measure underemployment? Well, I have measured underemployment. I had a paper published in ASCII about uh, social welfare in Cuba uh, and the effect of the Raul Castro reforms in which I show how I do measure underemployment. And there is a, there is a figure uh, with a statistical series. So I have done that. Okay. And, and you do it by counting the number of people that were left in the, what the, the Cubans call in, in nominas infladas. It's an euphemism. Uh, jobs in the state sector that are not necessary. Okay. And it, by account, is that there were about 1.3 million left, despite uh, Raúl uh, uh, requesting 2010-11 to dismiss these people because they, not enough of them were dismissed because of the non-state sector they didn't ex expand, but not enough to get all those all those people. Okay, thank you, uh, Jorge. For years, the Cuban government has made it a point of pride that they will never use the army against the people. It's been a point of pride in Cuba for as long as I can remember. Um, and the way they've handled protests, never as large as when they've just dealt with, but the, the way they've always dealt with protests is they sort of contain the protests and act, they try not to attack the protesters and then afterwards, they go and quietly arrest those that they can. Uh, so this was a departure this time in the way they handled it. Can the government use the army against the people? So um, you're, there have been many uh, local protests over the years. Um, sometimes it is workers in a factory who are unhappy not necessarily with a political regime, but with a really terrible manager of that factory. Sometimes it may be in a municipality. Sometimes it may be because people go to the pharmacy and they find no medicine. There, there are a great many of these. And uh, a more capable political leadership, Gary, as you noted, would handle a variety of ways, uh, both to persuade and to explain uh, and when necessary to use the either local committees for the defense of the revolution or the uh, local police to arrest people and defuse the protest. The, the, the last big protest that got out of hand 
uh, was in the summer of um, 1994 on the Malecon near Havana Harbor. Uh, and at that time, uh, those local uh, means, those diffuse means um, were not sufficient. And that is when Fidel shows up uh, and that is when the Ministry of the Interior special troops um, were called up. In general, uh, special troops of the Interior Ministry have been called at other times when local police are not enough. In general, there seems to be a very clear policy not to use the armed forces that depend, among other things, on a uh, on military con conscripts on the draft, not to use the armed forces to control internal protests, but instead to use the professional forces under the Ministry of the Interior that are the special troops. For the most part, they have been sufficient. Uh, they were sufficient this time. Uh, this was a very large uh, protest uh, as I mentioned briefly, but others have commented on, uh, dozens of cities and towns, um, pretty much every province throughout the country. This was a very big deal. And the Interior Ministry demonstrated uh, that it has the capacity to do that. Among the unfortunate descriptions of what happened uh, in Cuba in July is the expression, a failed state. No, no, it may be a very inept, an uh, uh, ineptly governed country. Uh, it may have been a brutal and unwarranted use of force, but it's not a failed state. It won uh, that confrontation. Would it, can I envisage calling out the armed forces as opposed to interior ministry troops? I can envisage it. But if so, it would be a much more severe uh, set of circumstances. The country would need to be in civil war, which is not a scenario that I anticipate um, any time uh, foreseeably. Um, let me just take a moment, Gary, to address uh, Carmelo's two thoughtful points. So uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, implementation matters. A a pretty law uh, drafted the way lawyers uh, would want to do it is not enough, uh, of course. I was making a, a, a tiny point, which is the timing. They had presumably approved these weeks ago and they had not moved. And so what they did in August 6 is to send the political signal. This is in the way, we, we're not yet going to tell uh, Carmelo or Mauricio or anybody else, maybe Omar is all right, but not uh, you other guys, uh, what the law says. Uh, but we do want to send the political signal that there is movement. I think that's all that was. And yes, you're, you're right. We need to wait to see not only what the law says, but how it will be applied. Uh, and that we will not know for months, I mean, we will need to observe it. I think the nose dive, so uh, to be self-critical of a part of my presentation, uh, what occurred in mid 2021, just days before the protest, is the convergence of many things at the same time that seemed unrelated. That from the perspective of a single individual, the Things were bad, but now all of a sudden they're much worse. Uh, it is the high inflation. It is that I cannot get food. It is that I cannot turn on, I don't have enough money for an air conditioner, or maybe I have a little fan. I cannot turn that because there's a, there's a power blackout. Uh, all of a sudden the pandemic, which I as a simple person had thought was under control is now much worse than it had been at any time. So I think it uh, was- can I, can I ask you a question? A combination, yes. I, I agree that it's a combination of uh, measures. So I, I won't be so easy in terms of rejecting some of Omar and my own uh, reasons for, for this. Yes. I think this is, these are factors you have to take into consideration. Yeah, but yes. the, my question is this, do you think therefore that now 
in Cuba, the situation is worse than in 1993? It is different than in 1993. With the pandemic, it is worse than in 1993. Remember, uh, you've worked far more than I have uh, very ably on the Cuban uh, healthcare system. Uh, the Cuban healthcare system seems to have broken down this time. If you are an ordinary person uh, stuck in your home, realizing that COVID-19 is out of control uh, in <clears throat> when it had seemed to be managed well, that something like that did not happen in the early 90s, even though it deteriorated sharply and access to medicines in the early 90s was a very serious problem. The sense that the healthcare system had broken down, I think is new. That again, that's a political comment. Okay. Um, we get some questions from the audience. Um, from Roger De La Torre, an illustrious uh, former member of our central committee, I mean, our, um, <laughs> our, our board, wants to know, can it start to mando las decisiones economicas, Gil or Luis Alberto Rodriguez Lopez Cajas? I didn't understand. Have to repeat it slowly, please. Okay, who is, who is taking the economic decisions? Gil or Luis Alberto Rodriguez Lopez Cajera? Bueno, es, eh, esa eh, preguntita está un poco compleja. Eh, es, hay que dif, definir dos cosas. Realmente el GAE, que es donde está López Calleja, eh, tiene una parte importante de la economía, pero no es la mayoritaria. Sí tiene el circuito, podríamos decir, más dinámico, es el circuito en divisas. Estamos hablando de las tiendas, estamos hablando del Mariel, estamos hablando de una parte de las habitaciones de los hoteles, que es, ya es la mayor parte. Pero sin embargo, ese grupo no maneja producción de petróleo, producción de energía, gas, alimento a la población. Entonces, como que ahí habría que, lo que sí está claro, eh, la biotecnología tampoco entra dentro del GAE. Entonces, a la visión de las personas, como es el sector eh, dinámico, es el sector que tiene que ver con todas las tiendas, tiene que ver con el turismo, tiene que ver con la zona especial de María, tiene que ver con los, con los bancos, o sea, el Banco Financiero Internacional pertenece al GAE podría darse la idea de que tiene un peso importante. Yo sí creo que tiene un peso importante en la liquidez del país, en el dinero que se maneja. Yo, y eso sí yo creo. Y yo creo que hay decisiones que deberían haberse cambiado y no se han cambiado. Es decir, no entiendo por qué se sigan construyendo hoteles en estos momentos cuando la recuperación de los hoteles del turismo va a ser entre, dentro de tres o cuatro años, cuando hay todavía capacidad en hoteles porque la ocupación en Cuba nunca fue mayor que 50. Es decir, hay toda una, una serie de, de cuestiones que, que tendrán que verse. Eh, ahora, eh, está funcionando el, toda la semana algo así como un consejo económico que preside el, el Ministerio de Economía, donde el ministro, el, el presidente del país funciona. Pero yo creo que es para las emergencias, es para saber qué se paga, cómo se paga. Eh, yo creo que aquí hay reuniones por reuniones y por, eh, por haber, hay todos los días una. Hay un día de la COVID, hay un día con académicos, hay un día con lo otro, pero al final yo creo que lo que espera la gente son resultados. Es decir, esfuerzo, yo creo que sí hay bastante, pero resultados no lo hay. Y si los resultados no hay, es que los esfuerzos tienen que estudiar bien cuál es la causa de que no hay resultado, porque todo esfuerzo lleva un resultado. Yo quiero añadir una pregunta porque sé que ahora va a contestar Jorge. Tú muestras de una manera impresionante el cambio en la dirigencia, el, el cambio eh, en términos de género, de, de raza, de, de edad, eh, los comparas con lo que había antes y son gente nueva. Eh, y, tú le, y tú le llamas institucionalización eh, o mayor institu institucionalización. But, The question that I have for you, uh, don't tell me time will, will tell. I mean, you know enough to answer in terms of your opinion. 
do you think that this is really going to make a difference? You made the point about that they, they selected the worst of the people elected, which is a very good point. Uh, it's a sort of counter force with all the positive uh, changes that I mentioned before. Does the Canel really have power of its own? What is the role of Raul Castro? You see, Raul Castro is 100% retired. I mean, in practice, what do you think? Okay, um, so uh, I think Diaz Canel really does have power, uh, and he is gaining more power. Uh, the I think it did not serve him or Cuba well that he spent all so much time after the April uh, Party Congress just for why he have to why he have to call Raúl to appear on Monday after the process. Okay, so that, I was going to go to that point. Raúl okay. is not totally retired. Uh, Raúl is retired in the same way that Carmelo Mesalago is retired. <laughs> uh, 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 you know. And uh, Raul continues to be a significant political uh, figure and political force. Uh, and uh, so do some of the other uh, senior leaders in the leadership who are formally retired. Um, but the, the, the relationship, if you will, uh, you know, the, the Escanel power really has risen. And this is a new team. Uh, among the more significant change, political changes is getting rid of the old secretariat, the Jose Ramon Machado secretariat. Uh, so that, 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 and that matters for economic policy changes in the future uh, as well. So I think that is significant. That's not, now the, the, the first part of your question, Carmelo was, you, you wanted me to, comment that the Escanel and Raul, but before that, I think you said something that then slipped my mind. Oh, I mean, whether all these changes. Uh... Oh, whether they matter, yes. Okay, no, no, I know. So the, the demographic changes, I think they matter for some people symbolically. Uh, I use the expression demographic inclusion in order not to use the expression demographic representation. I do not think that uh, uh, Esteban Lasso, president of the National Assembly and Afro-descendant, is representing Cuba's blacks. He is leading the, the Cuban Communist Party. He's a member of the political bureau, president of the Council of State, and race is something that he sometimes pays attention to as a policy matter, but not most of the time. And so I don't think that these Symbolic changes uh, are decisive in any way, but they are a change. Uh, it is, I didn't show on my PowerPoint, but if you compare it to Fidel's last Council of State, Fidel, pardon the expression, was the only one, did not give a damn about how many Afro descendants he did or did not have in the leadership. Fidel clustered around himself in all of these elite institutions, his same old buddies from the 1950s. Uh, so that is a symbolic political change of great importance. No, the much greater importance is the personnel rotation. And that's why I spent more time in the, you know, the entire secretariat, uh, most of the senior generals, uh, half of the political bureau, half of the central, that's, those changes matter more. Okay, thank you. We're running out of time. I got a couple more questions uh, from the audience. I won't get to them all. Um, Renee Castales, I think the uh, Jorge has already answered this to a large extent, but kindly comment on the relationship of the Ministry of Interior with the Armed Forces. Historical evolution and current indicators. Well, you do not have time to an historical evolution, but. Okay, so let me just try to, uh, because the I, I see the time, um, uh, respond to it quickly. Part of my answer I already uh, gave a few minutes ago, um, namely, uh, whenever there is, whenever there are protests, such as there were this last month, uh, and repression 
uh, is ordered, it is the troops of the interior ministry and not uh, the troops under the armed forces ministry that get called out. Historically, Raul Castro had always had authority over both the Ministry of the Armed Forces and the Ministry of the Interior. Uh, after uh, Raul um, uh, left that post and became uh, the uh, um, first secretary of the party, president, uh, first secretary of the party, president of the Council of State, president of the Council of Ministers. Uh, then what you have had is officers who had been in the armed forces who become ministers uh, um, uh, of the interior. Uh, and in that way, uh, it emphasized further uh, the kind of supremacy of the armed forces ministry over uh, the Ministry of the Interior. The main exception uh, to that is the most recent change. Um, over the past, since 2015, the Ministry of the Interior has gone through a great deal of instability. Abelardo Colomé stepped down because of ill health. The next two uh, interior ministers uh, died, uh, died disease and old age. Uh, and the newest one, the incumbent, who just entered the central, the political bureau, he had not been a member of the central committee, had been promoted from within. And I see that there was a question in the Q&A later on as to who is he. Uh, he is General Lázaro Alberto Álvarez Casas, and he had been promoted from within. But the pattern had been, up until his promotion, switching a general from the armed forces to become Minister of the Interior. OK. Gary, yo, yo me voy a tener que retirar porque ya no tengo datos móviles. Es que empecé a las nueve y media. Y... Está bien, está bien. Vamos a cerrar. Um, I'll leave some questions later for some of the members who want to come back in another panel. Doreen and David, if you come back, we'll be happy to answer those questions later. Um, I would like to tell the audience, though, quickly that um, uh, yes, this will be, these sessions are being recorded. And for those members who have registered and paid, um, or at least paid, okay, not attending, uh, they will be available shortly on the web um, via our website and uh, YouTube. So stand by. And um, so I think that finishes up for now. I appreciate again all the participants. I got to say, it was a captivating discussion. We started out with a good number of participants and hardly any left during the two hours. So you were doing something right, all of you. Thank you very much. So we'll see everybody at two o'clock. Gary, Gary, can yes. I can I talk just one minute with Joy Lee Juan? Sure. Joy Lee, are you there? Joy Lee? I, I think she went. I think she went to a sleep already because she's like for the time.